Now wave those hands. I came to pump. <laughs> <laughs> what you say? Don't be shy. Just feel it and feel free. I know you came to have a good time. We about to get We about to get loose. We about to do what we came to do. Are you ready? 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 I went from saying are you ready to are you ready? 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today is the 18th day of the 11th month in the 2020th year. Music is still going, and that's okay. My name is William Bryant Miles, but you can call me WBM, which means you're watching what? The wonderful world of WBM. Um, as you can see, you may be watching me on one of two platforms. We've got the Instagram going. I'm just coming back just for a little something fun for the kids who, you know, that's not where it all started, but we were there for quite a while. So I'll be toggling. And then I've also got my friends here on the YouTube. My new friends, my old friends, my old friends, my new friends. Well, no, it actually be my new friends, my old friends, my old friends, my new friends. Everybody's got a friend. Um, today, if you can't tell, my skin was badly in need of some repair. So I have on a face mask. Not sure I'm supposed to leave it on as long as I'm going to, to be here with you guys. But I wouldn't have it any other way. I have the Mieli. Is that how you pronounce this? Miel, Mieli. <laughs> I hate when they do that and like it's not necessary. This is the pomegranate and honey hydrating face mask. Um, so we'll see. I've used it before. I've enjoyed it. We'll see how it all goes. And today I have a different kind of show for you guys. If you haven't, if you're new to the channel or to the experience, the wonderful world of WBM, we, me, myself and I, uh, consider this to be an emporium of ideas, a wonderful confection, cavalcade of creativity. And so you never know what you're going to get. If you haven't already seen it, the interview with Nico Anin, the WBM interview with Nico Anin is on, is up. Uh, someone asked me if this is blackface. It's a face mask, but you know, I'm sure when you see the thumbnails, you're going to think I'm in blackface and that's okay. Um, this is skincare. Um, we can talk about blackface, but this is skincare right now. Um, so like I said, the, the Nico on an interview, parts one and part two, it's only a two part interview. Parts one and part two are up. I encourage you to watch it. If you haven't already tell a friend about it. Um, we talk about, uh, it's part of the black gay and on screen series. If you didn't know, I did a month long exploration of black and gay characters in the canons of film and television. Uncle Clifford being one of them. And then we also just talk as actors um, and creatives, or rather I talk to the actor about what it means to be black, gay and on screen. And you know, this week I had a conversation with a very, very dear friend of mine where I actually got like a little emotional in the conversation. I've been very emotional this whole week. Um, I, we'll talk about that in a second, but I got emotional because I don't think people really understand. Well, I'm not gonna say I don't think, but I cannot state enough the importance of visibility um, and being able to see yourself in media, right? And I think that like people who have always seen themselves in media don't understand just how important it is and how that shapes our identities, especially when you are possibly from communities or you live in a community where you don't get to see yourself reflected back in your community, right? And so I think that that's even where a lot of cis hetero black people, black men especially, I think, don't always understand uh, the plight um, or the complication of black gay folk because it's like, you've, you've, you've seen yourself in so many places, you don't really, and, and while you definitely have not seen yourself if you're a black straight man, you haven't seen yourself as um, much as 
a white straight man, but you've seen yourself. And for a lot of black gay people, they've never seen themselves. And there's just so much power in that because um, there's power in the possibility. So yeah, check that interview out if you haven't yet already. Um, let me know who else you would like for me to interview. This is not a one-off. That is one of the many things in the Emporium. Um, this live show, you know, we do all kinds of tutorials. I'm not teaching nobody how to do shit. tutorials. There ain't tutorials. I don't know the fuck I'm doing it to begin with. But I'm not even dabbling in anything. I have on the black face, which I guess, you know, I did sit with myself and was like, should I put it on or not? But I'm like, at the end of the day, I'm not wearing black face. I'm wearing a face mask, which happens to be black. Um, and even though that may communicate something else. I also am a black person. I think this would be more challenging if a white person did it. And I'm not doing this to um, be politicized, even though how can you take it out, especially when we're talking about representation. Um, but yeah, the more I look at myself, the more I'm like, ooh, child, I'm feeling like I'm in bamboozle. Um, but the only thing I wanted to talk about in pop culture and all the shit that I normally talk about is the Real Housewives of... I was about to say Long Island City. That's another project I'm working on. The Real Housewives of, now I was about to say Atlantic City, doesn't exist. Salt Lake City. I'm going to go in depth about that on another day because I actually want to just get into this. But if you haven't watched it, please do. All I'm going to say is somebody is married to their step-grandfather. And somebody almost died getting their odor glands removed. They may or may not be the same person. So, how many of you guys have ever seen or heard of this book, Invisible Life by E. Lynn Harris? Speaking of visibility, this was the first time I really, I think, encountered the possibilities for my I'm an adult and I visit this book. This book is really about a bisexual man's quest for identity. I do not consider myself bisexual. I do not have receipts that would suggest that I'm bisexual. But I'm going to just go ahead and read from this book. And that's all we're going to do today. I'm just going to read to you for an hour. Invisible Life, a novel. Actually, let me get my tech a little better so that this lives on in posterity. We may talk about what I'm reading, so there may be some editorial. We'll see how, I, how moved I am. Invisible Life, a novel by Elin Harris. Now, I will say this is me talking... This quote at the beginning, I live for. I have always lived for. Walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, must be a duck. But then again, it might not be a duck. Bloop. My nose is running, by the way. So we'll see how that works out with this mask on. The beginning or the end. Protected by a crisp, cloudless sky, I sipped iced tea on the dusty wooden deck of my parents' home. There was a trace of heat, no humidity. It was a few days after my 29th birthday and I was pondering the next step in my complicated life. While deep in thought, but savoring the Southern tranquility, I heard my father come through the sliding glass doors. He quietly placed a large envelope addressed to Raymond Winston Tyler Jr. on the wrought iron table, gave me half a smile, and returned through the doors. I immediately recognized the familiar feminine handwriting at the New York City postmark. I quickly ripped open the envelope, ignored the card, and began to read the letter of the soft pink stationery. Dear Raymond, I decided it was time I responded to your letter. How could this happen? Never before have I received a letter filled with so much pain, yet so much love. The last six months have been like a wild roller coaster ride full of extreme highs and lows. I find myself numb over the recent events. Why did it happen to us? Why can't we live in a perfect world? Before continuing to the next page, I laid the letter down, noticing that the moisture from my iced tea glass had caused the name on the envelope to blur and dissolve into an ugly black mess, bringing to mind my current life. As I studied the envelope, I asked myself, how did it happen? And that was just the preface. We don't know what this book is about. A reading rainbow. Chapter one. 
There is something poetic about falling in love. The tingling sensation lingers like the lyrical words of a Langston Hughes poem. There is something romantic about the changing of seasons. A romance reminiscent of an unending summer or one as fleeting as spring and fall. Whenever I think back on the loves of my life, I am often reminded of the seasons. There are four seasons and I have been in love four times. It was summer when Sela, my girlfriend and I drove the five hours back to campus. On this beautiful day, there was no way of knowing that my life, like the season, would soon change. My black Volkswagen was filled to capacity with our clothes, books, albums, and items that we couldn't live without during the summer vacation. As we drove down Highway 17, the heavy August sun beat down on us. The Alabama sky was a shimmering summer blue. State troopers were out in numbers trying to catch the fancy cars exceeding, excuse me, fancy cars exceeding the speed limit, giving special attention to cars with the university and Greek organization, Greek letter organization stickers. Sela and I were both especially excited this year because for me, it was my senior year and I would finally be heading to law school while Sela, now a junior, was moving into her sorority house after a couple years in the dorm. In the midst of the excitement and happiness, I was feeling a bit melancholy because this was going to be my last year. I was going to miss Sela and my fraternity brothers who kept my life at this lily white university interesting and fulfilling. My fraternity, Kappa Alpha Omega, editorial right now, how funny is that? Which fraternity is it? It's all of them, Kappa Alpha Omega. Kappa Alpha Omega was one of the three black fraternities on campus. While the white fraternities and sororities were going through rush, which we never understood, we were planning a big party to welcome back the black students. Also note that in this book, black is always written with the lowercase. We would get a head start on pressing the freshman girls to become our sweethearts and persuading the top black freshmen to pledge K-A-Q. We decided to have the party at the house of one of our advisors who was also one of the few black faculty members at the university. He owned a huge old rustic house outside of town surrounded by trees so large they cast an indelible shade over the two tennis courts and aqua colored pool. It was the ty type of house I dreamed of one day sharing with Sela. Since I was the social chairman of my fraternity, Sela and I arrived early to make sure that everything was set. We checked the music and food and made sure the keg of beer was ice cold. Sela looked beautiful in her white tennis outfit. It was a pleated short skirt with a matching top that looked wonderful against her vanilla wafer brown complexion. Her long black hair was pulled together with a crimson satin ribbon that flowed down her back. Her face with deep dimples. You can't see my dimples right now. I just realized that. With deep dimples. And almond shaped hazel eyes was accented by an open smile. I'm going to just type a comment about what we're reading. If you just joined us, it's Invisible Life by Elin Harris. Running around in circles over you. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody involved has all the tools they need. As I watched Sela help our sweethearts prepare for the party, <laughs> I thought back to the time almost six years ago when I had first laid eyes on her. It was the annual citywide basketball tournament and about five of my football teammates and I went over to North Birmingham to Northeast High for a game. Northeast High was like most of the high schools in Birmingham, an all black basketball team and cheerleader lineup of blue eyed blondes with the exception of a pair of identical brunette twins. As my eyes made it to the end of the line, I saw the most beautiful black girl I had ever seen. She had two thick ponytails, one with a gold ribbon and the other with a light blue ribbon that matched her uniform perfectly. Whenever there was a timeout, Northeast's pep band started to play and the cheerleaders ran onto the court and started their well-rehearsed pom-pom routines. The black girl on the end was spectacular. She appeared to be using her ponytails and high kicks to conduct the band. As her kicks got higher, her ponytails flew in her face temporarily blocking her view, but never causing her to miss a beat. Her blue, gold, and white pleated skirt twirled like a kaleidoscope against her light brown skin. As the band played the theme from Shaft, the cheerleaders and crowds chanted in unison. Now, this is where I'm supposed to know the theme from Shaft, but 
I don't know the melody here, but go Chargers, beat those bears, go Chargers. I became mesmerized by the cheerleader from the opposing school. I became so wrapped up in her that I wanted to cheer for Northeast High instead of my own school. While I watched the cheerleaders every move, someone came up behind me and put his huge arm around my neck in a playful strangle. When I was released, I turned and recognized Bruce Grayson, one of Northeast's star football players. Ray Tyler, what are you doing in my neck of the woods? Bruce asked. I'm over here to see my boys kick some Northeast butt, I joked. So it's getting gay already, as we can see. Bruce and I had met during the summer when we were both training at the President's Health Spa downtown. After taking a couple of minutes, I asked Bruce who this vision of ebony beauty was. He told me her name was Cela Richards and that she was his play little sister. During halftime, Bruce introduced me to Cela. When we left the two of us alone, when he left the two of us alone, I became so nervous, not knowing what to do or say, that I put my hands into my orange and white leather football jacket, took them out and placed them in my tight fitting blue jeans and just kept staring at Cela. When I finally found the courage to ask Cela for her phone number, one of the girls on the cheerleading squad came up and grabbed her, telling her it was time for the second half. She smiled at me. It was nice meeting you, she said, and ran off with the blue-eyed blonde. During the second half, I thought of ways to approach Sila after the game. Before the game ended, Bruce came up to me and gave me a little piece of paper. Sila asked me to give this to you, he said, smiling. I looked at the paper, and there they were, the seven digits that would lead to my first love. This is so period. They ain't even had to use an area code. Um, that night, I couldn't sleep for thinking of Sila. I got up at 6.30 a.m. the next morning and I called her at 7.15 before I left for school. Our first date was that evening at Baskin Robbins. Our romance blossomed quickly, even though we lived in different parts of the city and went to different high schools. I attended every Northeast game they had in the city, often borrowing my father's car to take Sela and some of her cheerleader friends to basketball games outside the city. I gave Sela my football jacket and she gave me her tiny gold cheerleader megaphone chain with the Northeast emblem. It was not long before I had fallen in love with the first female in my life other than my mother, grandmother, or favorite aunt. I think it's funny that he said favorite aunt, like, so you weren't in love with your other aunts or you didn't love your other aunts. Running around in circles over you. It didn't take long before the party started jumping. A sweet rain had lifted the dizzy August heat. Since KAQ was the largest Black fraternity on campus, we always had the initial party and almost every Black student on campus would be there, even those bookworms who probably wouldn't attend another party all year. It was great seeing everybody, catching up on what had happened during the summer and seeing the latest dances that people brought back to campus. As the night wore on, I noticed a tall, muscular guy who seemed to be attracting a lot of attention from all the females. He stood against one of the banisters, looking unapproachable, not saying a word. He was dressed in white linen and looked too mature to be a freshman. White linen. From his muscular body, and side note, white linen, that shit stinks. But shout out to Elizabeth Taylor. From his muscular body, I could tell he was a jock, but he wasn't with the athletes at the party. Sela and her sorority sisters gathered in a clique, laughing and flirting with the stranger. He danced with a couple of them. I could tell from the way he danced and from his haircut, extra short, extra short on the sides, that he was not from the South. No, this guy was East Coast for real. The party lasted until the wee hours of the morning. And after the beer ran out, we switched to KAQ Punch, a combination of fruit juices and pure green alcohol. The next morning, I woke up with one of the worst hangovers ever, but I had to get up to drive to Birmingham and catch a plane to New Orleans for my cousin's wedding. Why Terrence and Beverly chose August instead of June was a complete mystery to everyone in the wedding party. While on the Delta flight to New Orleans, I had a dream that bothered me. I didn't quite remember all the details, but the stranger from the party the night before was in it. He was visiting the campus to see if he might want to come to the school next year. All during my stay in steamy New Orleans, I thought about the dream. I was puzzled as to why I was dreaming about a guy I had only seen once and to whom I had never spoken a word. My return flight to school went smoothly and didn't include any illusions about the stranger or Sela, 
whom I dreamed of often when we were separated. So if you guys don't know, if you just joined, I'm reading from Elin Harris's Invisible Life. Um, this book, as I mentioned before, I don't remember if it was, it must have been junior year. It had to have been junior year because this was the moment when I really not r recognized that I was gay because I think I knew that about, or not recognize I was attracted to boys. But I think two things happened to me when I encountered this book. And the funny thing is the aunt that gave me this book actually is very staunchly religious and kind of homophobic. Um, and she hadn't read the book. A friend had given it to her. And I was just like, can I borrow it? And she was like, sure, look at God, look at God. But I, even just like this section right here, just this dream that, right? Like that curiosity, that nagging curiosity, we all... Um, spoiler alert, this book gets queer, but it's like just those moments. We're eight pages in and I already, you know, I read this book in like one day when I first encountered it. I was so like, oh my God, this is what I'm feeling, right? Like I have these, these memories of boys that are uncomfortable and maybe even hard to define. Let's see where we end up. <clears throat> The football season rolled around and with it, much cooler weather. Fall was advancing against the backdrop of immense sky. Braids of yellow, red, and teal leaves created delicate hues as beautiful as the sweaters worn by my classmates. September flew by and on the first Friday in October, I was in the locker room at the athletic complex after hitting some tennis balls with one of my frat brothers, Trent Walters. There's really black boys named Trent Walters. Whatever. Trent finished his shower and started back to the frat house where we always gathered before starting the weekend of partying. This was the weekend of our first home football game, so there was there would be some serious parties. KAQ was giving a party too, but this weekend we would be competing with the two other black fraternities for attendees. After I finished dressing, I headed toward the exit of the locker room. I was looking down at my shoes, trying to decide if they needed shining. Fellas, do y'all really shine your shoes like that? Or is that another period thing? While trying to adjust my collar from the back, I bumped into a hard body. Oh, excuse me, I said. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. Sure, no problem, the stranger said. When I looked up at him, my mouth dropped open. It was him, the guy from the party, the guy in my dream. Do you have a comb, he asked. Excuse me? I was in a complete state of stock, a complete state of shock. Was I seeing and hearing him correctly? Do you have a comb? He repeated. A, a comb? I repeated as I tried to regain my composure. Yes, a comb. Uh, I don't think so. Let me look. I suddenly became very nervous. He was staring at me as I frantically looked in my gym bag for a comb. It, it doesn't look like I have one. I said, I'm sorry. No reason to be, he said. Thanks anyway. As the stranger walked away, I stood in the same spot, speechless, not knowing what to do next. Suddenly, the stranger stopped and turned around toward me. Where's the closest place you can buy liquor around here, he asked. Duncan County, about 35 miles away. Do you go to school here, I asked. Yes, unfortunately, I do. Why say it like that? Well, this place is different. Yes, it is. Where are you from? Philadelphia. Philadelphia, I asked, a bit surprised. Ever heard of it? <laughs> of course. How did you wind up down here? Football scholarship. Oh. My name is Kelvin Ellis, he said, extending his massive hand towards me. Raymond Tyler, I said, as we shook the regular way and then went into the Black Power handshake. Where are you from, Raymond? Alabama. The whole state, he said, with a smile, he asked with a smile, exposing almost perfectly white teeth. N no, I'm from Birmingham. Uh, I've heard of Birmingham. Kelvin and I had now walked out of the locker room toward the enormous football stadium that anchored the athletic complex while talking about school and the game tomorrow. What position do you play? I asked. Defensive back. Are you playing tomorrow? Nah, I sprained my ankle this week. That's why I was down in the locker room in the Whirlpool getting treatment. Oh. Do you have a car? He asked. Yes. 
How much would you charge me to run down to Duncan? I got to get a couple of cases of brew. <laughs> Nothing. I have to go down anyway to pick up some beer for my fraternity. What dorm are you in? Westview, the athletic dorm. Okay, be outside in about 30 minutes. I'll be in a black Volkswagen. Great. That's, um, that's, that line is weird. I got into my car. I wanted to see if Sila wanted to ride to Duncan with me and my new friend. While I was driving, I began thinking about the dream I had had about Kelvin. Should I tell him? No, he would think I was weird. I began to hum the, music, the theme music from the Twilight Zone to myself as I pulled up in front of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority house. I went inside and asked the girl at the desk to page Celia Richards. Celia Richards, Celia Richards, you have a guest downstairs. She called over the loudspeaker. Five minutes later, there was no sign of Celia. I left and went to my apartment, changed clothes and headed west, headed toward Westview Hall. When I came to Westview, I could see Kelvin standing against the bike rack. He had changed clothes too. As I approached the dorm, I blew my horn and rolled down my window. Get in, I said. You don't got to say it but once. He smiled. As we drove down the highway toward Duncan, I could feel Kelvin staring at me. When we talked, he looked me straight in the eyes. I wasn't sure why, but this made me feel a bit uneasy. We talked about sports, school, and of course, females. We stopped at the first liquor store in Duncan. Kelvin purchased a beer, a case of beer, and I bought two cases plus a six pack for the ride back to campus. While our initial conversation started out tense, after the first beer, we both appeared to loosen up. Are you dating anyone? Kelvin asked. Yes, Celia Richards. She's a Delta and my HTH. HTH? Yes. Haven't you heard of Hometown Honey? Hell no! Kelvin laughed. HTH? The time seemed to go by so fast. I became comfortable talking with Kelvin he was very bright for a freshman. He had a deep baritone voice and a wonderful East Coast accent. Well, look at that casting. He was very pleasant and seemed to know exactly what he wanted out of life. Yes, I thought to myself, a perfect KAQ pledge prospect. What about you, I asked. Do you have a girlfriend? Yes, back in Philly. The babes here are so country. I guess... I was driving pretty fast. With the sunroof open, the cool October wind breezed through the car. We had drunk a couple of cans of beer and I started to get a slight buzz. Plus, I had to piss. Mind if I pull over? This beer has me running. No problem. I can use... Oh, sorry. Let's take that back. Mind if I pull over? This beer has me running. No problem. I can use the stretch. I pulled over along the side of the road and we both let out some of the beer we had consumed. <laughs> the oyster colored sky appeared solid as the setting sun shivered against it and the light breeze blew its own way. Editorial note, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm willing to bet money that Elon Harris was real proud of himself with that sentence. I'm gonna say it again. The oyster colored sky appeared solid as the setting sun shivered against it and the light breeze blew its own way. Kelvin and I sat on the front of my car and continued our conversation. He told me about growing up in Philly. I shared with Kelvin some of my childhood memories growing up in the South. I couldn't believe how comfortable I felt talking with him. I gave Kelvin my opinion of different people and places on campus and the virtues of pledging KAQ. Kelvin seemed interested in most of my conversation, but sometimes he appeared to be staring off into Never Never Land. Do you consider yourself open-minded? He asked as we got back into my car. Yeah, I do. How open? Pretty open. As we got closer to campus, Kelvin's questions became more personal. I wondered what he meant by open-minded. Do you sleep with your girlfriend regularly? He asked. Often enough, it's hard sometimes with her in a sorority house and me in a one-bedroom apartment with a roommate, but my roommate and I have worked out a system. A system? 
Yeah, we have signals. Like this weekend, he has to vacate the premises. He will either break the dorm rules and stay with his girlfriend, or he'll stay with one of our fraternity brothers. Oh, I see. Would you like to come by my apartment and help me finish this beer? I asked. <laughs> sure, why not? I'm out of football for a few weeks. Okay, man, let's do it. I'm game. Once we reached my apartment, I gave Calvin another beer. I was putting the rest in the refrigerator when he walked into the kitchen. Nice apartment. How much is the rent? Two fifty. Two. Um, I take that back. Nice apartment. How much is the rent? Two fifty. Two fifty. You kidding? No. Two fifty. A place like this near Penn would cost three times that. It would. Yeah, it would, Raymond. Can I ask you something? He was staring at me again with his light brown eyes with their curling black lashes. There was an ardent look about them. No man had ever looked at me this way. Sure. What did you think I meant when I asked if you were open-minded? I, I don't know. I, I really didn't think about it. You didn't? No, I didn't. What did you mean? <laughs> well, I'm not sure the good people of Alabama are going to be able to deal with me. Why, I asked. Because I'm bisexual, Kelvin said. You're what? I asked, almost spitting out the beer I had just swallowed. Bisexual. I make it with guys and girls. Haven't you heard of it? Yeah, sure. We had sissies at my high school. Do I look like a sissy to you? N -n no, of course not. But, but what? By this time, I was getting nervous. Kelvin was standing very close to me, literally blocking my path to the living room and front door. Should I run or should I hit him? I just stood there and continued to talk, trying to change the conversation. You want to go grab a pizza? You're avoiding my question. N no, I'm not. It's just, it's just what? Well, Kelvin, you're a good looking guy. You could probably get any girl you want. And I do. Don't you like girls? I love women. Nobody eats trim better than me. Trim? Yeah, you know, pussy. Oh, okay. Then tell me, Kelvin, why in the fuck would you want to mess around with a man? Variety is the spice of life. If you say so. So, Ray, tell me. Have you ever made it with the guy? Hell no, I protested. Don't get bent out of... Hell no, I protested. Don't get bent out of shape, Raymond. The questions in the conversation were making me agitated. I wanted to appear more sophisticated. Maybe this was an East Coast thing. Did Kelvin guess about the one time I had experience, experimented with my cousin Marcus when we were both around nine years old? We had really only compared the size of our growing Peters. How could he possibly know that? I look Kelvin straight in the eyes. I'm not bent out of shape. That shit's not my style. Maybe you haven't run across the right man. <laughs> Trying to avoid Kelvin's eyes, I looked down at the gold shag carpet. I think Elaine Harris missed, he could have said, trying to avoid Kelvin's, he could have talked about the color of his eyes again or the shape of his eyes. Anyway, there was, there was an adjective missing there, I think, if I can edit a book that's 30 years old and sold millions of copies. Um, let's take that section again. Trying to avoid Kelvin's eyes, I looked down at the gold shag carpet. When I decided to look up, I noticed Kelvin's erection bulging through his jeans and became even more nervous. What had I gotten myself into? This guy was bigger than me. There was a brief, uncomfortable pause. The silence was as heavy as one of my grandma's homemade quilts. Well, man, we better head back to campus, I said. Sure, come here for a second. There's something in your hair. 
Without thinking, I moved closer to Kelvin. With the palm of his hands, he softly rubbed my entire face. I quickly pulled back. What the fuck are you doing? I shouted. A slight smile flickered over his face and he said, your skin looks so smooth that I had to touch it. I didn't respond, silenced by his stare. His eyes were deep set and defiant. And that's why he didn't do the thing there before got it. His eyes were deep set and defiant. Then he touched my nose and moved his fingers down to my lips. I don't know why, but I didn't stop him as he cupped my face and suddenly kissed my lips. I couldn't believe it, but it felt so natural. It was the first time I had ever kissed a man. I had never felt a spasm of sexual attraction toward a man. Honest to God, but his kiss? I had never kissed anyone like this, not even Sela. Before I was conscious of it, I was kissing Kelvin back and putting my arms around his waist. His force left little room for hesitation or resistance. I felt his strong body pressed toward mine and an erection in my jockey underwear just aching to come out. I finally managed to pull back when I realized my sex was now full and hard, pressing against my navel. Kelvin looked down at me, gave a half cock grin, and then pulled me toward him once again. This time, there was no resistance. What was happening? This sinful, sexual longing, this was wrong. Everything in my head screamed, no. Yet my body was saying, yes. We stood in the kitchen kissing nonstop for almost an hour. Where's your roommate? Kelvin whispered in my ear. Don't worry. First, I said, all of a sudden, I felt Kelvin's hand touch my sex. And then with a single motion, his hands unzipped my jeans, releasing my throbbing penis. We continued to kiss passionately as he led me to the bedroom. Everywhere he touched became sensitive. My nerves became raw, tingling with unknown enjoyment. Movement of his body against mine felt as sensuous as powdered sheets. Moments later, we were both butt naked, lying on the edge of my twin bed. We managed to stop long enough to push the beds together. On that Friday night, the first Friday in October, I experienced passion and sexual satisfaction that I had never in my 21 years dreamed possible. Until that Friday evening in October, sex with females was all that I knew. I never imagined sex with a male. I never. I never imagined sex with a male. I never imagined sex with a male. Sure, I had noticed or envied guys with great bodies while playing high school football, but I never thought of it in a sexual context. I had never before given a man's body such lofty regard as I did with Kelvin. How would I have known that rubbing two male sexual organs together would bring such a complete feeling of ecstasy? Woo cha! We're gonna stop there. That's page seventeen. So, like I said, can you imagine being fifteen years old, sixteen years old, and encountering that? You know what I mean. And it's crazy because I had definitely, I think, at this point, I'd already, I definitely had seen straight porn. You know, I was exposed to porn at a very young age, um, just like in the neighborhood with kids and stuff. But um, I don't think I had seen gay porn. But there's something about this that wasn't like that sex scene, like especially now that I'm a full grown adult, right? Like that sex scene was whack, you know? I mean, first of all, I think all they did was jerk off. I don't know. But um, it sounded like a frat encounter. For those of you that don't know what frat is, frat is when two males, um, I actually don't know if it only applies to males, but it's like they have a sexual encounter, like the rubbing of penises, uh, mutual masturbation, basically everything except for penetration. And some people don't include oral penetration in that. Some people do include oral penetration, but absolutely not anal penetration um but there was just something about like that the the how palpable that was right and just how uncontrollable those feelings were and so this book goes to explore much more than um sexual encounters but it's just so I, I just wanted to revisit that that was on my spirit today to share that with you and if you haven't read the book as we saw with him having to call the dorm you know front desk for her to be paged to come downstairs it's a period piece and it really harks back to harkens back to 
um, the bulk of the book takes place in New York City, although they do go back to Alabama a couple times. But um, the bulk of it takes place in New York City. And so just reading about gay New York from like the 90s, like in its peak, you know, the, the late 80s, early 90s, um, and also at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic is, is a treat. It's a, yeah. So maybe we'll revisit it. I don't know. But that was what was on my spirit to share with you guys. The more I'm in this black face, the more I'm like, woo child, was that a problematic choice? And I I, I stand by what I did um, because this really is just a face mask. Maybe they shouldn't have made the face mask black, especially because it's pomegranate and honey. Like, what are the ingredients? It's water, glycerin, peat, charcoal powder. Oh, there we go. K K Kaolin, bentonite. I think bentonite is black too, but I could be wrong. Dimethicone. I don't think that's a good thing. Polysorbate 60, sodium acrylate, sodium acrylodimethyl taurate, capolimer, pheno, phenoxethanol, sodium benzoate, coleus barbaratus root extract, honey, punica granatum, which is pomegranate extract, amorphalus, amorphophallus, Conjac root powder, Anthemis nobilis, which is chamomile flower extract, aloe barbadensis leaf juice, tacopherol acetate, panthenol, silk amino acid, xanthan gum. Xanthan gum be in everything. Xanthan gum is in hot sauce. It just be everywhere. Um, and disodium EDTA. It is time to remove it, but I'm going to do that off camera because I don't have nothing here to remove it. Um, someone asked, I think it's about time to remove it, right? <laughs> yeah, so today's episode was fairly short. That's all I wanted to share with you guys. Um, that's all I got. I don't know if this is actually going to live on in the world. We'll see if this, how this lives in the zeitgeist. But yeah, that's that. Um, that's all I got. I want to thank you all for <laughs> tuning in. Um, because this was fun and different, um, you know, and that's why I'm giving you my whole little, I'm literally ready for bed. I brushed my teeth, but that was kind of a dummy mission because I'm over here drinking something. Um, he said, oh, it's not appealing. Go, no, this is actually like, I'll show you guys. It's like, oh, no, you have to wash it off. See, or can I peel it? I don't think I can peel it. No, see, it's on my fingers. You have to wash it off. You have to wash it off. But now it's kind of like dry. What's funny is it's very dry now. See? Mm. That's funny. What if it stained my face? What if, what if, what if? Um, no, that's all I have for today. Um, next week is... Thanksgiving, um, which is on a Thursday. So we'll be here on Wednesday doing this as we always do. I'm so excited for all the other creative concepts that we have coming forward for you. If you haven't already, um, if you're not watching on YouTube right now, please join us on YouTube, The Wonderful World of WBM. You can also follow me on all social media platforms at Rhinestone Stair because life for me, honey, ain't been no crystal stair. It's been rhinestoned and I keep climbing. We're live every Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And yeah, choose joy because this is all we got. Um, I thank you for tuning in because you could have literally been anywhere else, um, but you chose to be where you are, you, but you did spend some time with me. So yeah, so that's that on that. And I'll see you all next week. Let me go read my book. Get a tat, uh, let me get a tissue. <laughs> no kidding. Let me go wash this off my face. Love you all. Talk to you soon. Bye.